Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis, and today we have back again one of my favorite people of all time, Brandy Drumroll <laughs> Walker. And we're going to talk about grief again. Surprise, surprise. Welcome. Thank you. This is your <laughs> Glad what, to be third here. time? Third time? Fourth this time? This is my fifth podcast. It's a fifth? It oh is. Oh my gosh. But we've it. only done one on grief. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. I was like, I was thinking when you were coming in, I was like, okay, have we talked about grief too much? And I didn't, you know, take the time to look back on what we talked about or how many times. Yeah, fifth. I think you're the uh, the showrunner. You've been, you're the, you get the award for the most. So, you know, the rest of my therapists who are too scared to come on here and talk about things, I challenge you. Brandy's on number five. I think it's great. Yeah, it's been fun. Okay, so yeah, I know grief is something you're super passionate about. Um, if you haven't heard, Brandy's an amazing LPC. Um, she was... Her and Jenna, who's another one of our therapists, but very part-time, is a good friend. And you want to tell kind of your story of how you got here, and then we'll get into in, you know what you do and who you are, and then in case they don't listen to the other five episodes of four episodes. Okay. Um, well, okay. So um, our journey to Clint Davis Counseling was we were, me and Jenna, as you mentioned, were at another counseling agency that <clears throat> abruptly decided to shut down and... And you had been doing what? How long had you been a counselor at that point? At that point, I had been a counselor since. So that was in 2019, and I'd been a counselor for since 2010. So almost a decade, right? Right. And then it, that that you had been an LPC that long? Yes. Okay, and then you did a few years before. Well, no, that. 2010. I was started being a PLPC. Got it. Became LPC. By 2012. Yeah, so you were seasoned when you came to me. Yes. Yeah. So yes. you had worked other places, done other things. Yes. I had done six years inpatient, six and a half years inpatient, and then I went to that business, and um, they decided to close down, and thank we had... You, w- thank you, that business. <laughs> I would not have brand Well, it there. actually w- did turn out to be like... God orchestrating things, but yeah, I remember at us that over moment, at the Warrior Network yes. uh, office and talking, and y'all just both being on the couch, like doing a double interview, essentially. Right. Yes. Well, we had one week's notice, and then we didn't get paid. Um, and you brought us on. We started, but like <laughs> went without took, took money a for yeah. a really long time. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Uh, so coming to Clint Davis Counseling, it, from my point of view. <clears throat> That this is like this, how we do things is what I always imagined doing. It just took me that many years to get to the spot, yeah, (laughs) that I could do it in that way. That's awesome. So, yeah, well, great. So, we know a little bit of your story from the last time, but uh, if you want to tell that just you know, a few minutes of kind of why grief you're so passionate about it, and then we'll talk about what grief is and get into the questions. Okay, so, um, so grief oddly enough, has always been something I was interested in. And I did a lot of grief counseling prior to having a whole lot of grief experience of my own. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, as a child, I experienced a lot of grief, but I didn't carry that with me into adulthood. But Mm then in um, 2018, we began a, a, a series of deaths. So starting in 2018 until the end of 2019, had seven family members pass, one of those being my fiancé, who died, like, right in front of me (laughs) unexpectedly. Right. And it, like, just totally upended my world, changed everything that I even thought I knew about grief. Mm -hmm. And just, I was just kind of plunged in a world of figuring out how how do you get through something like this. And so I did... Tons of my own therapy. Um, I just did lots and lots of work and lots of just diving in, trying to understand how how do you, how does somebody move through something like that? Mm-hmm. And so it began my journey of like recognizing that we're very ill-equipped to help ourselves, to help anyone move through it. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we we all kind of know that that word, and we all go to funerals, and we know, you know, we've heard loss or, you know, grief. But you're right; when it happens, it's amazing, you know, how we don't know how to handle it. Right. You know, I've there's been a ton of situations that you know, here in Shreveport and Bossier and other places where 
you know, there's been somebody who's passed away or, you know, kid drowns or somebody gets shot or there's an accident and, you know, we get called by a church to say, Hey, can you come in and talk to our people, you know? And so, you know, I'll go in or somebody from our practice will go in and they're like, we're so glad you showed up. We had no clue what to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and you're like, Oh man, we need to equip people on what to say. There's no, we don't, we're not, as therapists, we don't have magic wands. Like, you know, we're not just coming up with this stuff out of our, you know, out of our own head. Like there, it takes learning and reading, but yeah, a lot of times it's, it's book knowledge until you actually experience it and walk through it with people. Right. And then you have that like, Oh, okay. Right. It, this sounds good, but mm -hmm. I have to actually go through it to get it. Right. And there are different, um, mm, different levels of grief, different types of grief. So some, some people, when we experience loss, it's not life altering mm -hmm. or upending. Um, and then you have, situations where it is. So if someone has not been through a situation where it's like totally transformed their, their life, then they, they, it's kind of like what you said, you have to experience the, um, <laughs> the kind of grief that is life altering to really begin to understand what grief is and how you move through it. Does that for, make sense? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, I think for a lot of people listening, you know, there's going to be a mixed bag. Like some people, some people, my wife and I talk about this all the time. She's never really been to a funeral of someone who was really close to her. Mm -hmm. And up until my grandparents, I had been to funerals, but I'd never been to the funeral of anybody who was super close to me. I think there was one friend of <clears throat> mine that for a season we were close and then I didn't see him for like eight years. And then he died pretty young. But, you know, it was like mm -hmm. that it was sad, but that wasn't personal. And my grandfather was probably the first funeral I went to that was like personal. That was somebody who I loved, that was mm -hmm. very close, that I was attached to, that I have all this meaning and feelings and memory and experiences and needs. And yeah, I was a complete mess. And I remember my grandmother's very sweet, but, and she's my other, you know, one of my other favorite people and she's passed now too. But I remember I was in the, in like the back to the left, we're in this little tiny ba uh, big Island Baptist church in Deville, Louisiana. I mean, there's, 10 people there and I'm in the back just I mean falling apart I mean just I've never cried that hard in my life and you know I realized I was a therapist at the time too and I knew okay I'm processing Afghanistan I'm finally crying about just this other issue and this other issue I've just never l let it all out you right know? and I'd been to therapy and I'd cried a little bit but like this like kind of made all of that come to a head and my grandmother came over and she put her hand on me and you know I was like oh she's gonna be supportive you know and she's like you've got to pull it together <laughs> Which was fine. I mean, I get what she was saying, and I, I did need to kind of get it together at some point. But it was also, I was just laughing at just like, nobody knows really what to say. And it's not right. okay for you to fall apart, especially right. me and the family system that I'm in. I'm, I'm the one who doesn't fall apart. Right. Um, and JC, my wife, was like, yeah, I've never seen you like that. So I just she just kind of sat there. And she's like a little bit deer in the headlights, but a little bit like, I'm just going to let you do what you got to do, and I won't pressure you to do anything else. And that was helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but also overwhelming for her. So it's like, it's all that stuff that's all mixed up in there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what is grief? Like, how would we define it for the average person? I know there's nuance to it, but how would you define it? Right. So grief is, it's the actual emotional part of what you're feeling when you experience loss. Got it. So it's the, it's all the feelings and the stuff that's going on internally. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so emotions, feelings, which are kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> when you're experiencing loss. So what is loss? So very good question. <laughs> so loss is actually a whole lot of things. So mm -hmm. loss is not just death mm -hmm. and we don't just grieve over death. There are a myriad of things in life that create loss. Mm -hmm. Um, some of those being, <clears throat> excuse me, divorce changes in career when people retire. So sometimes we even grieve, good things mm -hmm. that are changing. Yeah. Um, so retirement. And usually change is a part of that, right? Like you're, yeah. you're, you're, you've lost something, mm -hmm. right? an idea, right. a perspective, an experience, a time period, mm -hmm. a person, a job. Right. And right. so then mm -hmm. you, it, you feel like it's gone forever, right? That's the loss. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's gone. You can't get it back. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Or um, things like, 
financial changes, pet loss, um, significant health changes, Mm -hmm. um, getting older and losing your independence, um, breakups. And some of these might sound strange because sometimes even like when someone graduates from high school, Mm -hmm. it's super exciting, but also their world for some people, it's not an exciting process. It's, it's, it's loss. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you lose friends, you lose your place in the world, you lose your, um, you know, what it may be, whatever status you're in. I mean, that's the funny thing about like school and high school, you know, we're all in jobs. You're always like, well, maybe you're at the top of your game and then you're a freshman and you're like, Oh gosh, now I'm back at the bottom of the right, barrel. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Even things like getting married. It can be both Oh yeah. Super great. And also like I'm leaving this whole world I used to know behind and I'm having to adapt to this. So some things that can bring up grief type feelings, oddly enough, can be good things. It's just adjusting to leaving behind something and moving towards something. Mm -hmm. So there are different types of grief is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. And so what are some of those? Um, okay. So, <clears throat> so we have normal grief, which is typically when, when someone passes and it, it doesn't upend things. Mm-hmm. You, f- you have feelings, you're processing it, it, it hurts, you, you miss the person, or if it's a situation, if it's a job loss, or if it's um, a change in a, fr- in Maybe a friendship. It's something that does not um, devastate. It, well, well, it might devastate, but not for forever. not for an extended period of time. Like so, normal grief. I would say, kind of roughly, you you begin to improve, at least by the six month mark, mm-hmm. and and symptoms and feelings begin to decrease over improve. time. So I think this is kind of the nuanced part of talking about it. It's mm-hmm. like. I know you would agree with this, but it's like improving would assume that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. But if let's say it's a, you know, grandparent that you're close to, Mm -hmm. they pass Mm -hmm. away. The grief is appropriate, right? So there's nothing wrong necessarily with your emotions and your feelings. Right. Um, But something is wrong because as a Christian, we would say that person wasn't supposed to die. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the interesting part, right? Like what's, what's, Wrong is that you're experiencing something God didn't intend. Yes. Right. He intended the garden. Right. So loss was not a part of the original plan. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have these moanings and groanings for what, you know, God has set out. And, and when it's not what God set out, it's going to be painful and it's going to suck. And it's going to be something we've got to deal with as human beings. But I think what we've gotten into, and you'd correct me if I'm wrong, is then people make unintentionally or intentionally, people feel bad for grieving things. Yes. That are that that happened. Like it's like, well, your grandmother died. She was ninety five. So don't have any feelings about it because it was supposed to happen. Your pet lived twenty years. Right. Right. <clears throat> and so we go, yeah, something is wrong if you're crying, if you're sad, if you're overwhelmed, mm-hmm. and it'll get better. Instead of being like, well, my question would be, how how can we talk about that better or in in a more therapeutic way with people than saying it's maybe it gets better or I can't remember what you said the word, but like a uh, Improves. Yes. Well, the the symptoms and the intensity of how you're feeling the feelings around grief begin to lessen. There we go. That's good. Yeah. (laughs) But it's it's funny because we put these kind of like, without even meaning to, we put these little moral kind of things on it where you go, okay, well, I'll get better. Mm -hmm. As if crying about your grandmother who passed away is bad. Right. It's like, no, that's appropriate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the symptoms of that should reduce and get better. Yes. So like normal... Normal um, and why, why grief. Is, why and is that? Why is why what? should it get better? Why should the symptoms reduce? Why should they reduce? Yeah, your grandmother passes away. Like, why is there a certain amount of time? Well, because mm-hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> because when you it it you should. People should position themselves to work through it because it's not healthy to stay in that kind of intense, upsetting, 
types of thoughts and emotions for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, because it keeps you off balance, unfocused, um, can affect your health, like your physical health. It um, disrupts the flow of home life, mm -hmm. work life. Like it, it can, it can be um, debilitating. Yeah, because grief takes you out of the community mm -hmm. and into kind of surviving these feelings and these emotions and these fears and this pain by yourself, which is appropriate for a time. Right. Right. And okay, so and this is where it kind of gets even more nuanced because we have all these definitions of different types of grief and how long they're supposed to laugh and the laugh last is what I meant mm -hmm. to say. The reality is Sometimes you got to laugh from crying. <laughs> but the reality is is regardless of what type of grief you're experiencing and we'll talk about the other types as well, but the length of time you're in it a whole lot goes into that um, that isn't in a textbook, mm -hmm. even though we have textbook answers that say normal grief lasts this long and complicated grief lasts this long. And this, the reality is, is the, the, inten how in, the intensity of the relationship to the thing you lost a lot of times dictates how long you're going to be in it. Mm. So if you have, a, you know, we've talked about attachment a lot, so attachment not just being like a normal word but being like hey i get my needs and my worth and i value my value out of this person they've been through a lot of things with me i'm very close to them i'm emotionally tied to them mm -hmm. i maybe even have an inappropriate amount of dependence or connection or whatever to this person then that is part of the problem is that we going into this loss we weren't differentiated enough to not need that person at a certain level that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you agree? Sure. <laughs> no, I, I do agree. I think it's, but again, it goes back to it's, it's so complex and sure. It's case by case. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you have healthy relationships, you have unhealthy relationships, you have estranged relationships, you have, um, or, or not just relationships, just situations in life as well and when depending on your personality your resilience resiliency right mm -hmm. and how you know what your beliefs about the world are Temperament. how you face things yep. how you all those things come into or play a factor in how you're going to move through grief exactly and if you're going to allow yourself to move through grief and what you're going to face and when you're going to face it so yeah, it's like good. Well, I think that's what we're talking about today. It's like that is that is the process is that it's a lot. It is a lot. And a lot of people lose something. It wrecks them or they go into it unprepared. And then <clears throat> once they're in it, they don't take the time to stop and assess all of those things and kind of pull, you know, weed through the like, well, why is this so devastating? Should it be devastating? Right. right. How long should it be devastating? And then they have all these people around them in the world saying all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, you'll never get over this or you need to get over this tomorrow or, right. you know, whatever expectations are put on by culture. Yes. And if we don't have people in our life that are walking through that with us and personalizing that and asking us exactly what's going on for us and what our backstory is, then, yeah, I mean, it, it's a mess. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of things that our society has taught us um, a lot of times unknowingly. Yeah. Like it's not like someone sits in front of you and says when you have negative feelings about any situation in life, this is what you, you know, what you do. But society has taught us through actions, through TV, movies, advertising, all these different things that – you're not supposed to feel bad about anything mm -hmm. for longer than this much time. And if you do, there's something wrong with you. Exactly. And I think that's the important part of like looking at scripture and looking at, you know, healthy mentors and counselors to go, okay, here's what the Bible says. Here's what God, you know, here's what Christ says about grief and life and loss and putting it into the context of like, yeah, you can't just have watched, you know, old yeller or, you know, whatever, you know, 
where the where the, where the, where the <laughs> red fern grows. I mean, these sad, horrible right. movies <laughs> that now I'm like, golly, I can't believe my parents let me watch that as a kid. You know, like, and yet, it's the other problem with I think grief. And I'm going to go on a tangent, but like, the world today, most people don't have to actually see anyone die, right? Or an animal die, or mm-hmm. a person die. So I think it's interesting that we're so bad at handling grief because we haven't been forced to see it. And again, I'm not saying we right. should, right? <clears throat> but just for all of human history, it wasn't an option. And for most of the world, it's still not an option. Right. Do you well, think that adds to like why we're so bad at dealing with death and loss and grief and all these things? Oh, sure. I think that's a part of it. I think our community, like community has changed. Mm-hmm. So well, we don't have our world is fast paced. You go to work, you go home, for a few hours, you turn around to go to work. Like, it's just this, there was a time when, yes, people went to work, but they slower paced living. When someone passed, everyone gathered. You you were together. You worked. You expected someone to be sad, and people showed up for them. And, like, for long periods of time, it wasn't like yeah. this quick one day and then it's over type thing. Yeah, communal grief, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. the idea that, hey, this is actually our friend who works with us in this community and does this thing, and they got sick. And so we've got people to replace what they do while they their spouse grieves, and we can, you know, kind of carry their burdens. And as Scripture says, um, yeah, now, I mean, people die and nobody even knows or cares. Right. You and know, I, or they show up mm-hmm. for that one moment mm-hmm. for that funeral, and then they're gone mm-hmm. after that. And first, I also think that just as a whole, we don't have, our society doesn't necessarily place the same value on life Mm. as it once did. And it's also because everything, like you said, is out of sight, out of mind. And again, based on movies, TV, advertising, all of these things that we see, most people think it's not going to happen to them. Even though if you are born, you are going to die. (laughs) Yeah. The other side of the coin is that they're desensitized to it because they've seen so much of it. Yes. You know, we're like, the kids are playing Call of Duty and blowing people away every day for eight hours a night. And, you know, so war movies and violence and all these things that they can see in 4K, Mm -hmm. you know, something they've seen before. Mm -hmm. Or you live in a dangerous neighborhood and you grow up in that that time and that culture and that city, um, you know, and so it's just what it is. And in some ways, you know, that, that suffering can build some resiliencies where you don't fall apart when things happen. Sure. But again, this goes back to relationships. Mm-hmm. How do you find out if you're handling it healthy mm-hmm. on your own? Mm-hmm. You don't. Right. You know, most people are just surviving. Right. They're either disassociated from their grief and their loss mm-hmm. and acting as if it doesn't affect them. Mm-hmm. Or they're falling apart <clears throat> in a complete mess because and I don't mean this harshly, but their pet of 17 years died. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, that's appropriate. It's been with you. You got a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. Like there is sadness and it's no place of mind to tell you not to be sad about that. Mm -hmm. But if six months or a year later, you're still can't get out of bed and are, you know, can't go back to work or can't function anytime you hear about that situation. Now we've got to go, okay, well let's talk about what, what's going on underneath all of this. Right. Right. Because that's not an appropriate response to grief. Right. And here's where we get canceled and get in trouble is defining what's appropriate for anybody. And it's like we live in the society now where it's like, well, don't tell me how long I can grieve. Right. And yet. And and that is true because grief, grief can last throughout your entire life. But if it's not changing and you're not moving through it, then you're not actually even really grieving. You're right. just sitting in yucky emotions Got that it. aren't moving. So that's the difference, right? Yes. It's kind of like um, in in the addiction world, people will be um, sober, but they're not in recovery. Yes. And so their thinking isn't changing. They're not dealing with the, the root issues. They're not... They're not identifying feelings. They're not facing feelings. They're not talking through these things. They're not changing habits. I mean, there's yeah. so much that goes into it. Absolutely, because a lot of that work, I know for myself, working through grief and lots of grief over, you know, not just people, but all the life circumstances and things that happen and, you know, miscarriages and war and abuse and all those things. 
I've had to get down into like, what's my view of God? And, you know, and mm-hmm. I've got to be mad at him for a second. I've got to lament to him and I've got to <clears throat> square all of those deep rooted beliefs about the world and how it functions and right. why it functions and who it functions for. Yes. And a lot of times <clears throat> I find myself realizing, I think the world functions for me and that everything is centered around me and my enjoyment and what I desire. And I have hopes and dreams that are, you know, good and human, but the, those expectations are way too high. Mm-hmm. And when those things get ruptured and all of my life and my success and my functionality is based on achieving that thing or that relationship or man, it, it can really do me in. Mm-hmm. I know I think about my grandparents all the time and like, you know, my, my grandmother was able to see my oldest son, you know, for a couple of years, mm-hmm. but my grandfather never seen, saw either one. And, the other night, we were, this is like two nights ago, Jude is my youngest. We're laying in the bed, and he's like, when did Papa Mitchum die? And Because that's his <clears> middle <throat> name, Mitchum, and so we'll talk about him. And How long do you have to live? And, you know, I mean, even at six, right. we're trying to figure this stuff out. And so we're having these conversations. And if we don't have a good worldview and framework and belief system about all this, then no wonder we don't pass on healthy views to our kids. Right, right. And a big thing, too, around grief and this may be moving in another direction but people feel like if they talk about your grief like if if you lost someone and I purposely didn't bring them up to you because in my mind I think if I talk about that person with him that's going to upset him like you're not already are always thinking about it. So people won't talk about it. They won't bring it up to you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's awkward. And then it makes you feel like, well, I can't talk about this person when a huge part of working through grief is being able to talk about that person. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a great tip. You know, if somebody's grieving around you, you know, I mean, be sensitive, but also like, Hey, tell me about, you know, John, or tell me about Sally, or tell me about your daughter. What do you like about her? What do you miss about her? Mm-hmm. What, tell me some good memories about her. People who are grieving actually love that and appreciate that. They and do. it may be hard and they may cry. Yes. And yes. I think that's the other side, right? Is like we're so uncomfortable with holding space for people yes. because of our own grief and all of our own unprocessed stuff. Right. Do you think some of that's because then that's going to bring up their own stuff they haven't dealt with? It. Sometimes, sometimes it brings up their own stuff or sometimes it puts them in a feeling of, I mean, yes, brings up their own stuff, but also, what am I trying to say? Like, um, when you feel really sad for someone else Mm -hmm. and you're like, you want to be there for them, but you don't know how to, how to help someone that is sad and their sadness is making you sad and you don't know what to do with your sadness for them. Like, yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's the point is uh, especially as Americans, like we want to fix everything. Yes. We have to do something about it. Yes. And I think a lot of grief is acknowledging, Hey, I don't know what to do or what to say, but I'm here. Right. Right. You know, can I just sit with you? You know, Mm -hmm. can I put my hand around you? Can I pray for you? Can I get you some tissue? You want something to eat? You know? Right. I'm just going to sit in this chair. If you want to talk about it, I'll talk about it. Right. You know, but I'm just going to sit right here quietly. Right. And people don't, you know, that's hard. And I, and that's and where. It takes practice. Yes. I think either people have to become educated about it or people that have experienced loss that, that was, you know, life changing. They can go and sit with people mm-hmm. and be in it because they, they've experienced how words don't change anything. There is nothing actually anybody can say that makes you feel better, but there are things people can say that make you feel worse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What are some of those? Ah. (laughs) So some of those things are things like, and sometimes it's even hard to just repeat them because they're so horrible, Um, but things like, well, you're young enough, you can have another baby. Mm -hmm. Or um, at least they lived a long life. Or... Or you'll meet someone, you can you can get married again, mm-hmm. or um, they're in a better place. That's one of my favorites. Because mm-hmm. just because you know someone has gone to heaven does not mean you're not in pain mm-hmm. because they're gone or that you don't miss them. Um, or things like God will never give you more than you can handle. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> or God's trying to teach you something. Mm-hmm. Or people that are really unhealthy and tell you, well, that's your consequence for all those bad things you've done, mm-hmm. which I've had just recently someone sit in my office and tell me that she'd been told by a pastor that she was being punished. Mm. And that is why this happened to her. And that is so not, <laughs> not true. true or biblical. Not yep. true or biblical. Yes. Yep. yes. Yeah, you're right. People say, and for y'all listening, like, you know, some of this stuff's probably triggering and a lot of you have heard this. I mean, I've heard several of those things myself. Um, it's easy to be very angry at people and to be very offended by what they have to say. I do think most of the people that say those things genuinely are trying to help. Yes. And most of those things you just said are true. Yes. You know, definitely not the God punishing you one, but a lot of those things are true, but not what's needed in the moment. Right. And, and so what is difficult or about ever, those sometimes. things is that they're into those are intellectualized statements, yep. which means there's nothing about that is speaking to the emotion of the moment or what that person might be feeling or even what the person speaking might be feeling, you well, know, right. it's like not, it's just not identifying or acknowledging that emotions needed in those moments. Yeah. Joining, attuning, <laughs> connecting all of those things that humans, you know, want and value. Mm-hmm. Those are, that's what you need to be doing in those moments. And part of that's development. You know, it's like, you know, we do this with kids a lot and I talk about this in the book. But, you know, kids are throwing a fit or you're in a fight with a spouse. Anytime anyone is emotional, Mm -hmm. you know, their right brain is turned on and their left brain is turned off. And so their logic brain, the learning Mm -hmm. is not working. (laughs) Right. And so people who are grieving are in their, they're in their right brain. They're overwhelmed. They're overstimulated. Mm -hmm. Their prefrontal is not working and telling their, you know, rational brain to help out, you know, and and it's shut down. And so, yeah, a lot of people come in with information Mm -hmm. thinking the truth will set that person free. And it doesn't help right? because they can't hear it. Right. Well, and also some of these statements or things that people say, it is like things like you can have another child or you can get married again, sends the message that there's something out there that can replace what was lost. And oh, there's yeah. not. Yeah, I was on a, <laughs> uh, I was on a, the stand recently. This is the last year or so. And it was a case. And... Um, it was a kind of miscarriage situation that it caused some trauma and it was some other things going on, but the, one of the lawyers said, well, you know, you had another child, like the person had had another baby after this. And I was on the stand and I go, I was like, uh, I don't know if you want to say that, you know, like, is that really what you want to say? I was like, do you have kids? And the person was like, not as like, so if one of them died, the other one would replace that kid. And the person was like, you know, and I'm like, okay, right. Let's get this right. Like <laughs> that's a bad way to win an argument yes. is to say, well, you got, you know, you lost a spouse, you lost a kid, you lost a pet and you can just buy another one, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, okay, that, that values that person. Then it puts a number, you know, or a situ, you know, a, a timeline on that person's value. And I think that's the nuance of what we're talking about with grief is you have to have, you have to be able to hold both two truths at one time, which is, yes, I mean, I can have another baby, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That'll be a great thing, and that'll be good. But that goodness doesn't replace the pain of this loss. Right. And shouldn't. Right. Because that was another person. Right. And I think it can, over time, be salve to that wound. It can help. It doesn't doesn't do nothing. It's not neutral, Mm -hmm. you know, because you enjoy... It doesn't replace, but it does help if that's what hope is, mm-hmm. you know, but using it as a weapon to say, oh, well, you shouldn't have had pain or this couldn't possibly have caused worse problems because you, you replaced it, mm-hmm. whatever the, the, it is, even a job, right? you know, because all of those things that were involved, all those memories, all those connections, all of those things, they're, they're, they still existed. Yes. It, and yeah, so... So we've kind of talked a little bit about the whole um, people not wanting you to sit in negative emotions for very long. So that's one. So one concept that's in society about grief is sending you the message 
you shouldn't feel bad. Mm -hmm. So do whatever you can not to feel bad, whatever that might look like. And it might be replacing the loss is what helps you not feel bad. And that can be with anything, whether it's death, whether it's job, girlfriends, boyfriends, friendships. Yeah, because people are trying to tell us that we're we're supposed to create utopia. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, our, our right. own little utopias in our life where mm-hmm. no pain or suffering or bad mm-hmm. feelings should happen. And that's then everything's going well. Right. And right. As Christians, we know, well, yeah, that's because heaven's coming. You know, our hope mm-hmm. is that one day that will be the case, that there won't be any tears or suffering or whatever. But we're not there yet. Right. So mm-hmm. it's interesting that a lot of secular training and people and just society who's not focusing on God is kind of pointing you towards the hope in heaven. And yet they want you to curate it right now. And you're the God of your universe. So just create it, Brandy. Like, right. <clears throat> you know, don't be involved in things that are hard or difficult or sad. And if things are not going your way, think differently about it or, you know, whatever. And then you'll have this little utopia again. Right. And I think loss wrecks all of that idea. It does. And then people double down and go, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I know that you have that feeling, but you don't have to, you don't have to. Right. Drink it away, sleep it away, mm-hmm. buy it away, mm-hmm. get married again quickly, whatever the thing is that you, right. know, you can right. do to fill that void. Right. Instead of what? Instead of figuring out what you are feeling, mm-hmm. facing those feelings, talking about those feelings, figuring out how to move through those feelings, how to live while you have those feelings. That's good. And that it's hard. It's not easy. No, it's miserable. But it... But one day it won't be as miserable if you keep working at it. And that's part of the problem is people don't want to sit in that kind of pain for a long period of time. Which, But yeah, that no. is the only way I through it. I don't want to either. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible, but the only way through it is through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, uh, I don't know. Do you know about buffaloes, how they deal with the weather? I don't okay. think I do. Yeah. So, so buffaloes, <laughs> when they're in a field... You know, they see like a rainstorm coming. Where, where do you, which way do you think they run? Towards it? They do. Okay. So they, they run toward, <laughs> they turn and run towards the weather because they know that they'll get through it faster instead of seeing it and running away from it. Okay. And so, you know, I love that, that idea because so many times we see the thing coming. Yes. And we try to avoid the crap out of it. Right. And we're like, oh man. You know, I got to, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And yet that it's coming one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes it's better to just face it head on and, and run into the storm. Right. You know, and deal with the issue, deal mm-hmm. with your grief, deal with the sadness, cry, throw a fit, you know, whatever you got to do. Mm-hmm. And then through that, man, it'll get easier and the storm will pass. But I mean, personally, I don't like doing that. Oh, you no. Know, it no. goes against everything that my right. body and my brain is telling me to do. Right. For a lot of people, um, it feels, uh, what have I heard a lot, inefficient crying and grieving and processing. You know, talk therapy, especially, you know, I'm sure you've heard this. Like, what is talking going to do about it? You know, like, how is how is talking about it going to solve any problem? It's not going to fix them. I, You know, it's like, well, that's not the point. Right. <laughs> the point isn't to fix anything. It's to, to be human, to express your story and to write your story in an appropriate way, to look at what story you've written and, and then you know, kind of project that for the rest of your life and know the meaning and the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. And to not keep it all in here, just spinning around. So if it's in your head, just spinning around, then, and this is possible even if you're talking about it, but if you're not talking about it, if you're not processing it, if you're not doing anything with it, it's still going to come out. Yeah, it's coming out in some way. Absolutely. Your body is storing <laughs> it up and you're going to get pain. You're going to get yes. aches. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like what, what are some of the consequences physically, emotionally, you know, of not dealing with your grief and not talking to somebody about it? And again, remember guys, grief is, and loss is not just about a death, but right. about all of these things, which everybody listening to this has grief and loss in their life right? that you need to be sharing and processing so whatever storm, I know you're, you're, whatever you're thinking of when I say storm, you know, think about how you can run into that thing and how you don't have to do that by yourself. Right. And um, if you don't, what can happen, Brandy? Okay. So some of the things that can happen, um, you, you can become physically ill. You like, it can be things like, um, just being, having less, um, 
It's like it affects your immune system. So then you start just catching random stuff, but it can be deeper issues. Like you can have some serious health problems emerge that cannot be corrected even after you do decide to process it. Mm -hmm. It can affect, um, can cause people to be very irritable. It can cause people to not sleep. Mm -hmm. It can cause um, rifts in relationships. It can cause people to be more angry, to withdraw, to um, have trouble making decisions. Um, I mean, it, it affects mental capacity for sure. It can either cause someone to be much more emotional about things than normal or have no emotion at all. Depends mm -hmm. on which direction they're, they're going. Um, That's good. That was a long I list mean, off the top of your head. And I'm there's impressed. more. I yeah, mean, yeah, for sure. trouble concentrating, memory loss. I mean, if you're not, Anxiety, those, some of those things yeah. can happen when you're dealing with it, but those are the things that begin to improve. But if you're not dealing with it, those things just get bigger and worse. Right. So those are appropriate <clears throat> symptoms of pain and suffering and loss. Yes. But when those symptoms are exacerbated and going over a long term period of time, and they're affecting your function. That's yes. what we're talking about. Yes. And I think we mix that up a lot in our society where we go, well, you know, people's heart posture isn't, oh, I'm really concerned about you. It's just, I don't want to deal with this. And this is hard and <laughs> inconven inconvenient for me to, you know, have to mm -hmm. deal with all this, come back to work and, you know, come back to our family, come back to the situation and get over it. It's just this, it's just that you can't grieve about this forever, which just makes the situation worse. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do you think? Um, what do you think the church can do about grief that would be more helpful? You know, what, what some ways that I know there's a lot of like grief shares and grief groups and stuff like that, but what, what are some things you, you know, you've experienced through counseling tons of people who are going through grief? From the, from the church perspective, I think yeah, just it's community. just, like if people um, are listening to this and they're like, they're a Christian and they go to church mm -hmm. and you know, there's loss all over the place. What right. are some things they can do? with those closest to them, but also with the people that are just in their peripheral relationship. Right. I think help. it's important to, um, not say all that stupid stuff. That yes. We not say all the stupid <laughs> stuff, but to acknowledge that person to sincerely check on them and ask, how are you? Can't, do you need to talk? Would you like to go to lunch? Um, offer space mm -hmm. for them to talk offer um gosh this is why it's so important to know our people yes like th this just makes me think of like you know i mean people that listen to the podcast or anything that i talk about is gonna you know they're gonna, like you've said this a thousand times but man our community is so important like it, grief outside of community is such a mess because mm -hmm. right? i'm thinking about people you know in past places that I've been where there's tons of people that I don't know, but they're supposed to be quote unquote, my community, like, like a big church. Right. <laughs> oh, it's supposed to be my community. Well, that means that this girl who I see every Sunday, cause I walk by her in the hall is my community. So then her dad dies and I'm like, okay, well how can I help her? You know, how can I love on her? Well, I don't mm -hmm. even know what she likes. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what she needs. I don't even know what would be helpful because I know nothing about her other than we're in the same community. Mm -hmm. That's not community. Right. Right. And I think one of the biggest problems is with the church, we need to make sure we know the people that are in our inner circle mm -hmm. so that it's not that you have to save everybody. Right. But goodness gracious, if somebody's died and nobody's doing anything for, for you, that is so lonely and terrible because what you realize is nobody knows me. Right. Enough right. to even know, should I bake <laughs> them a you know, a right. dinner or should I give them a gift card mm -hmm. because I'm nobody's in my life to know me deep enough to know what I would need. Right. And so I would challenge people like that's a great place to start is looking around you and going, okay, who are the five or six closest people to me that I call my community? Mm -hmm. If they're, if somebody died in their life or they lost their job or something, they got sick, would I even know what to do? Mm -hmm. And maybe start making a list. Right. And I, so I think, and there are different when, when something first happens, generally people do come and support sure. and are there. But, but would um, you say those things um, are helpful if they don't even know who you are? Like, Well, it, de it depends on what it is. Sure. Um, I mean, I think asking people, but hugs are very helpful. Can I hug you? Because it may be that 
whoever they lost, they haven't been hugged in two or three weeks. They have no physical connection or. And you're talking about in that immediate loss. Yes. Phase. Yeah. Yep. You know, or saying or showing up in ways like, um, and I know we do lots of things around food, but mm. when someone passes, the people affected, the, just normal course of life events are out the window for a while. Yeah. So they're not going to the grocery store. They're not making meals for their family. They don't even have the capacity to mm-hmm. think of that. So yes, providing meals can be a very important part of helping someone. Um, However, mm-hmm. what I hear a lot from people, and you tell me if I'm wrong, is they have 75 casseroles that they yes. don't eat in their refrigerator. Yes, that as well. Because <laughs> people cook things for them that they don't eat. Right. And that's what I mean is that yes. <clears throat> within all of the grief help, even the supportive stuff that we kind of do mm-hmm. outside of knowing the person mm-hmm. sometimes even does more harm than good. Right. You know, there's a vegan person at your church. There's a person in your, your neighbor. And you, you know cook them, you know, pork butt and, you know, potatoes and whatever else. And you bring it to them and it's like, that's thoughtful. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, mm-hmm. they're not going to eat it. Right. You know, like, so I think it's just so vital for people to really know the people who are in their life enough to be able to show up. I mean, it's, right. it, I'm thinking of people in my life right now. I'm like, okay. And that convicts me to make sure mm-hmm. that I'm. And you know, I, yeah, I agree. We in, know. in my experience, I totally didn't eat for months. So n- nobody cooked me anything or brought me anything. Cause, but my friends knew me well enough to know when I did want to go eat, they would take me and they would pay for it. Or I had one friend give me like 10 gift cards to oh, gift cards are great, places. Yeah. And so when I did start eating, those things lasted me a really long time. Mm-hmm. But so it kind of, I mean, yes, your friends knowing you is a very important part even even them knowing some of day-to-day routine to know where to step in yep can i come over and do your laundry can i do child pickup so you don't have to think about that for a week or yeah the reason is because you know the other worst thing is like when somebody's like hey tell me what you need right and they're while that's great Uh, sure you're not in you're not in the in the capacity Mm -hmm. You don't know what you need for a while because you're you're in a state of shock and you're having, when we're talking about death, we're, you're having to plan a funeral. You're in the deepest pain of your life and you're having to figure out how to put on a show mm-hmm. to say goodbye to someone. <laughs> yeah, we could do a whole podcast on that. We should. You can come and it's back. not always a show. Yeah, I know. You can, <laughs> it's, neither is church, but sometimes it is. Yes. You can come back for a whole podcast on why, how we do funerals and, and all that stuff terribly. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. What, um, you know, what would you, to wrap up, kind of what would you, what are any final thoughts you have? What is something that you, you know, you really want people to know about grief? Um, I think I would hmm, want people to know that it, grief is real you feel it for lots of reasons and not just for loss of a person Um, and that if you don't look into what whatever loss you're going through if you don't look at what that means to you all the aspects of the loss all of the things that it's going to come back Mm-hmm. you're going to continue to deal with some part of it until you do. Yeah. And I mean, I think it would, it's always going to come back, right? Like no matter how far you get away from it, mm-hmm. there's a couple of pieces of art that I love about it and they're both a little different, but there, you know, there's one where there's like jars and there's like a little jar and there's a huge mm-hmm. ball inside of it. Mm-hmm. And then the, the ball's the same size, but the jar gets bigger and gets bigger and gets bigger and gets bigger. And it's like, okay, your capacity to handle the grief gets larger, but Mm -hmm. the grief doesn't change. Right. So I think that's partly true sometimes. And then the other one is there's a, there's a ball, um, and it's huge and it's filling up this box. And then over time and the, and you know, there's a trigger in the box. And so the, the ball is just constantly pressing that trigger anytime the box moves, like just constantly triggering you. Mm Mm-hmm. And as you deal with the grief and deal with and learn skills and tools and resources and process and talk and all the things we talked about today, the ball gets smaller and hits the trigger less often. Mm-hmm. And so the grief is still there, right? but the smaller it gets and the more resources you have, 
mm-hmm. the um, the less often it hits the trigger. Mm-hmm. And I would kind of merge both of those because because mm-hmm. what I would say is there's a little bit of both happening. Mm-hmm. You are trying to lower those symptoms appropriately over time so that the grief itself isn't so painful, Mm -hmm. but you are also trying to in yourself build a capacity to tolerate hard things to where that, that trigger point, you know, isn't hit as often. Right. What do you think about that? Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. And a a phrase that popped in my mind that hopefully I'm going to get it right. Did a training with David Kessler and the way that he states it is you want to take grief from grieving in pain to grieving in love, mm. which means as you move through it, you process all the pain, all the bad things that happened, and you get to a place where you can remember, but you remember in love, not in pain. That's good. I like that. I don't know if I said it exactly right, but... Sure. Um, Forgive us, David. <laughs> yes, it's something to that effect. And it, I think that's very true because the longer you work through it, like you said, the less you're going to be triggered, the smaller it's going to get until it, which that does not mean that you're not going, that you don't miss that thing, that person, that whatever. And that there won't be pain every once in a while. Right. But yeah. it means you can think about that thing, that person, that experience, what you learned from it more often in a good way than in a negative way or a hurtful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think about, you know, let's say somebody had sexual trauma or somebody had a car wreck or somebody had a personal injury or an illness, you know, it's like, yeah, it's hard to hear this, but over time you do get to a place where you can look at that thing 20 years later and you can see, you know, how God, although that thing was awful, and not what God intended, mm-hmm. and it was wrong and anti heaven. Um, you grew from it, you learned things from it. Maybe, hopefully, the story would be you use that story to help somebody else, and so then it has purpose and it has meaning other than just disaster um, for you. Mm-hmm. But that's that we have to let people walk that out and not tell them that up front, right? You know, that's not the thing you tell somebody which is what we said earlier about, I think people were right. saying the true thing sometimes, right? <clears throat> but not the thing that a person needs to hear right then. And, and sometimes that's the, the way people do it. Scripture and the Bible and mm-hmm. Jesus. And they, you know, it's like Jesus didn't even talk like that. Like he wasn't like, Hey, you know, woman at the well, go and send no more. Cause I'm here. You know, right. like <laughs> that's not what he did. Mm-hmm. You know, he sat with her and processed with her and let her tell her story and let her grieve, you know, mm-hmm. the things that were going on. And then eventually he got around to saying right. you know, who he was and what he was for and all those things. So I think if we look to Christ and we look to his model, you know, he lived out everything he expects us to do and he did it perfectly so that we don't have to. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was at a funeral recently. I'll tell this and we'll wrap up, but I walked in and uh, it was a good friend of mine's uh, family member and the brother of the the guy was there and I know him, but I don't know him well. And, uh, I walked in and I, and I was looking, there's a bunch of people. It's a lot going on. And me and this guy met like twice maybe. And at the time I wasn't really thinking who he was. I just saw him and I knew he was attached to my friend and blah, blah, blah. And, but I walked up and I was like, Hey, uh, you know, he's like, he like kind of nodded cause he knew who I was. And I was like, how's it going? And immediately I'm like, well, duh, it's going terrible. Your brother passed away. Like that's such a stupid question, you know? And so as soon as I said it, I was like, I mean, I know it's terrible. I'm sorry. You know, like how are you is what I mean, you know, like, right. but we say things unintentionally. Yes. And we're going to not do all this perfect as therapists, as pastors, as people, guys, you're going to screw it up and say the wrong thing, but repair the rupture, you know, just circle mm-hmm. back and say, Hey, look, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I didn't know what I was saying. Right. I got flustered. I'm mm-hmm. overwhelmed. I made this about me. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. And that's going to go so far with those people. Right. So right. you don't have to do all of this perfectly. You can't. So be in prayer, be mindful, use your resources, um, you know, and just learn to sit in people's crap a little bit right. and, and the, in the tension and the difficulty. And, and, and think about it. If you were, if it were you, what would you want someone to say to you? Mm-hmm. Sometimes that might help in curtailing saying, <laughs> 
things that you shouldn't. <laughs> That's right. Well, Brandy, thank you so much for coming on and talking about grief with us. And uh, you do such a great job at our practice. I love having you. Well, thank you. I love my, being there. I know. <laughs> uh, you're one of my favorite people. Um, you know, one of the things about seeing you in the hallway, I mean, you're only two doors down from me. So, um, you know, I love your smile. I love it just when we get to connect. I love just getting to say, hey, and know we're in this together and that we're on the same, you know, mission field trying to just do this crazy counseling world. And I, I love the story God's telling through your life and through your ministry and through our ministry. And so I just really value you and appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be doing this work. It's needed. Absolutely. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you have anything you need, if you're hearing this, um, if you're dealing with grief for the first time, please email us, call us. We can help you or we can put you in touch with somebody in your area that can help you. Um, God bless you and have a good week.